Welcome everyone as we dive into a fascinating and an extremely important uh, subject for all of us, which is the connection between Nock, the book of Revelation, and God's promises of salvation. So we'll begin just by asking our Mother Mary's intercession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So I presume many of you, probably most of you who are watching this, and those of you who will be watching the recording later on, are familiar with Knock uh, and the apparition there. And so I won't have to go into a huge amount of detail to fill you in on like the actual content, let's say what you see, the apparition. But I do want to take just a few minutes and I want to read uh, one chapter and a little bit from the book of Revelation. So this is from the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. So Revelation has 22 chapters. And so I'm gonna read chapter 21 and then just the first part of 22. So it'll take just a moment, but it is well worth our while. So if you have your Bible there, you can follow along with me or you can just listen to this description. So St. John is uh, has been given a vision of heaven and he sees now kind of the, he sees the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, this, anyway, I, I'll, I'll, we'll go into details as to what it is actually and, and describing it, but I'll just read it for you now. So chapter 21, a new heaven and a new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and the gates at the gates, 12 angels and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates, and on the north, three gates, and on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. 
He also measured its walls, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the first part of chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no lamp, light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Okay. I want to begin by just saying a word about <clears throat> the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation, I'm not sure if you've ever tried to read it, but it is one of the strangest and most interesting books in the whole Bible, and it is notoriously difficult to interpret. Now, the most popular way amongst uh, Protestant evangelicals to read the book of Revelation today, uh, and they, they do, they really love the book of Revelation, but the most popular way amongst Protestant evangelicals, which has influenced some Catholics as well, is to see the book of Revelation after the first three chapters. The first three chapters are seven like letters that Jesus writes or has dictated to the churches in um, the early kind of Christian churches in different regions. But after those three chapters, the popular way that Protestant evangelicals read the book of Revelation usually is as like a straightforward description of the end of the world. That it's like a play by play. And it's just like written in code. And it's something that you kind of have to sort of interpret. Now, it's important to say that this is not the way that the saints throughout history have read this book. And it's also not the way that the church encourages us to read this book. Now, I couldn't give you, I couldn't possibly give you like an interpretation of the whole book of Revelation right now. Uh, I probably wouldn't be even able to do it yet myself. It would require a lot more study, I think, on my part. But I do want to mention this one way of, of this popular way that it's often presented because I've heard so much of it in recent times. Um, and understandably so, because the world right now feels, I don't know, how do you want to describe it? Apocalyptic sometimes, <laughs> apocalypti. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like, are we, are we in this? Are we in the middle of this, you know? And uh, people often will say like, oh, you know, this is now what the, uh, the, the 12 plagues or the seven plagues mean, or this is what, this is the antichrist, or this is the mark of the beast. This is things that you'll hear quite often. Um, but again, the, it, the, this book, we don't read it as like a straightforward kind of description, kind of play by play for those, you know, however many 17 chapters. 
uh, so 18 chapters, we don't look at that as like a straightforward description of the end of the world, basically. One of the most interesting ways to, uh, or maybe helpful ways to a key to reading the book of Revelation is to notice that it describes a spiritual process. So if you wanted to take this down as, as like a note, this would be kind of helpful for you actually reading it. So the book of Revelation describes a spiritual process. First, evil wages a battle against those who belong to God. Second, there are different reactions that people who belong to God have to this battle. Some are faithful, even to the point of death. Others capitulate to fear, and others give themselves over to evil entirely. And last, God's, God finally defeats evil, and he saves his faithful people. So it's like this spiritual process, right, that the book of Revelation is describing. If you get this down, if you kind of see this, it's very helpful because you see in this pattern, you see this pattern playing out repeatedly over history, over and over again. So you think about, for instance, the, um, like the, the people in Moses' time, right? Evil oppresses God's people. The people of Israel then respond. Some you know, with real faithfulness to God and others, you know, kind of learn how to live in Egypt, basically. And then God steps in and he delivers his faithful people. You think about it with Egypt. You think about it with, um, with Assyria, with Babylon, with Greece, with Rome. You think about it throughout the church's history, you know, in all different centuries, you see this kind of spiritual process playing out over and over again. Evil wages war against the children of the light. People face a choice. Will they be faithful? No matter what the cost, even if it means death. And then God judges evil and he saves his faithful people. This has happened uh, throughout Israel's history. It happened in the first century when the book of Revelation was being written. When St. John, John the Evangelist, had this vision, it was happening, it was unfolding then again with the Roman Empire, and it's happening now as well. We can see uh, in other parts of the world more strongly, Christians really being put to the squeeze. I think about places like China, specifically, you know, as, a, as an example. I know that there are other places as well, but, you know, uh, kind of the Chinese situation is something I'd be more familiar with. And we see it happening increasingly here as well. Um, not admittedly in the same, with the same intensity, the persecution isn't, but you, you're starting to see, I think we're getting more and more, we're becoming more and more different from the rest of society as believers. And it's going to get, it is at times uncomfortable already, and it will get more uncomfortable for us. The question I suppose is, or well, I suppose we could say this about the book of Revelation as well. It describes the spiritual process, which takes place repeatedly. It's like a, a, a cyclical process and it happens throughout in different eras is what we're saying. But it is important to say this about the book of Revelation as well, that it does describe in parts of, of the book of Revelation, it definitely describes the final working out of this. So it will happen at the end of time that God will judge evil and he will save his faithful people and he will decisively finish. He will decisively sort of win this victory. The question is that a lot of people are asking is, is what we're in now, are we going through those, that final working out of God's salvation? Are we in the final days? Possibly, you know, um, but as a priest who is supposed to guide souls, 
I would encourage you to beware of anyone who claims to have it all figured out. I would, I would encourage you to beware of someone who claims to have it all figured out. Now, this book is complicated, it's strange, but it is so beautiful and it's so good. Please don't be put off by the fact that it's like complex, right? Um, do yourself a favor, read this book, read the book of Revelation. You are going to draw inspiration from this. Inspiration for the situation that you're in right now. You are a part of this process. We're in the middle of this, whether it's the final working out of that process, we don't know, but uh, we're in the, in this process where again, you know, evil's putting the squeeze on believers and we have a choice to face. We're facing a choice, whether we will be faithful no matter what. And God will step in and save his people. So we're in the middle of it, whether we like it or not. And we are told to lift our heads up high and be confident in God's salvation. So the book of Revelation uh, is going to, is very helpful. Helpful to again, kind of uh, to inspire you, to strengthen you, put kind of a new heart in you. And it also helps you to love God with all your heart. The mercy that's described in the book of Revelation is beautiful. His love for us is stronger than any other power. The goal that he is leading us to is more beautiful than anything you can imagine. The, the eternal destiny that God has ready for us is what we just read in the book of Revelation. It's the wedding of the lamb. Now, that is what we're going to go through today. And we're going to reflect on this promise of God that this is where he's leading us. And we're going to see the connection with this remarkable apparition in Knock. So setting Revelation aside for a moment, just look to Knock. Um, I feel like I probably don't have to go into a huge amount of detail about the apparition at Knock, uh, but I do want to touch on a few things. Uh, like the book of Revelation, the apparition that happened at Knock is also fascinating to think about. There are no other apparitions quite like it. It's extremely important for all of us, especially who are here in Ireland. And it is notoriously difficult to interpret, just like the book of Revelation, right? So in 1879, on Thursday, the 21st of August, which was during the octave, celebrating the Blessed Virgin Mary's Assumption into Heaven, uh, there appeared at the back of the parish church in Knock a heavenly scene, the apparition of a heavenly scene. And for the space of two hours, the people of the village came and they went. Some prayed the rosary and others simply just took in the scene that was there in front of them. Fifteen witnesses then were called to offer testimony in the first inquiry in 1879. And then two witnesses who survived were again interviewed in the second inquiry in 18, uh, in, excuse me, 1936. So we know the scene. The scene is centered around the altar on which the Lamb of God stands with a plain cross in the background. And surrounding the figure of the lamb, you have this, uh, these figures of angels. And then to the left, as we look at it, of the lamb, you have St. John the Evangelist, who stands with the book of the Gospels or the Mass book. There's different, they're, they're, they weren't sure, the, the, um, uh, the witnesses weren't sure what it was, but this is pretty amazing. They were able to see the words written on the book. That's how close they were able to get. Um, St. John wore a bishop's mitre and he carried in his left hand that book and his right hand was raised as though preaching. To his right was the Blessed Virgin Mary. She was dressed in white garments that were caught up in a clasp around her neck. She wore a crown of gold with a golden rose embedded in the center of the crown, just above her brow. She had her hands raised in the, in the Oran's position, which is the posture of prayer. And her eyes were raised to, towards heaven. To her right stood St. Joseph. His head was bowed in prayer 
as though giving honor to the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's what the witnesses said. And his hands were clasped as though in prayer. Now the parish priest, again, a lot of you probably know this background, but I'm just kind of touching on a few things. The parish priest was a man named Archdeacon Kavanaugh, and he was a man known for his holiness. He had just completed celebrating 100 masses for the holy souls in purgatory, just literally the week before the apparition happened at Nock. I've heard many holy people say that Nock is at least as significant as Fatima or Lourdes, and also that the power of Nock has yet to be felt. These people Again, I, I really don't have a gift of like this kind of like spiritual insight or whatever, but these people have, uh, the, these, these people, I've, I've listened to people who I believe do have that gift and they're convinced that there are abundant graces that God wishes to pour out from knock into our lives and beyond that, even to the world. Now, even though I'm, I'm no mystic, I'm, I, that's not my, it's not my gift. I do know that God blessed us with a glimpse of heaven itself in Nock. And I know that in order to cooperate with God's grace that he gives us, we have to understand something about it. So what I want to do is I want to try to understand what it is that Nock showed us. And I want to look at what we can learn from Revelation about the marriage of the Lamb, which is what Nock is depicting. So let's look at those two scenes, Nock and also the book of Revelation from chapter 21 and that first part of 22. Both depict in slightly different ways the same scene, the final goal of God's salvation, the marriage of the Lamb of God. So we want to ask, what did Nock mean for the, to the people who first experienced it? What does it mean for us right now? And what does it mean for our future? The first thing I want to focus on is I want to think about those who have suffered and proven faithful. Remember in this working out, this process we've, we mentioned about the book of Revelation, that in every era, when kind of the fight was brought to the people of God, they stood facing a decision. Would they compromise or give in? Would they become like everyone else? Or would they remain faithful no matter what? Throughout the book of Revelation, or the whole, the whole book, we hear about the heroic men and women of our past who endured unimaginable suffering, but who proved themselves faithful. Not only did these faithful that these believers suffer, suffer the cruelty of life, you know, just the normal things that we all face, like death and, and loss and sickness. The faithful endured all of that and more. Persecution by the evil one and by those who belonged to the evil one in the world. But they would not betray, not even to escape the worst that evil could throw at them. These were men and women of courage and true faith. To be a disciple means to be willing to suffer or even to die for following Christ. That's, that's what it means. Mark uh, chapter 8, verses 34 through 38, Jesus makes this clear. St. John, who, uh, who was granted this revelation, St. John knew these heroes, these men and women, these noble souls who had a love that was greater even than death. They were the ones who entered into their reward, the reward of the vision of God. You cannot understand Nock without understanding the suffering of the Irish people. The generation who experienced Nock knew the worst kind of poverty. Poverty that left them exposed to sickness, eviction, and even death by starvation. These were a people who had been trampled upon for hundreds of years. 
and whose oppressors spared no effort above all to crush their faith. In the generations that followed that of the generation that experienced it in 1879, when they were reflecting back on Nock, kind of um, these people who were writing and kind of reflecting and thinking about it, when they looked back and were trying to understand why Nock and what, like why did um, Our Lady choose Nock and why at that time, the thing that they come back to again and again is the fact that this was a people whose faithfulness to God and to his church was heroic. They come back to that over and over again in their kind of reflecting spiritual and the meaning of Nock. And the vision, especially of Our Lady, they really focus on Our Lady's presence specifically. The vision, especially Our Lady's presence, was at least in part the consolation of heaven to those who valued heaven above all else. I'll say that again. One of the the um, the meanings of Nock, as understood by those who came after that generation and were looking back and were trying to, to understand, is they see that this was a generation who was faithful, whose faithfulness to God and his church was heroic. And that this vision and Our Lady's presence, specifically our mother, was a consolation of heaven to those who valued heaven above anything else. Consolation for a suffering people. God describes them in the book of Revelation as the ones who have conquered, the ones who have conquered. They faced and they overcame evil and temptation. And now what does God do? God in heaven wipes away every tear from their eyes. That's the words from Revelation. The time of mourning is over. This is a very important point that's emphasized again and again in the book of Revelation. This is the consolation now. This is the consolation. Not only this comfort, but this is like the source of comfort. Here it is. These men and women will receive their portion who is God himself. Again, God says these words, I will be his God, he will be my son. God says this about the one who has conquered, about the one who's been faithful, about the one who has suffered, but who hasn't, um, who hasn't given in. So God comforts his people, but the way that he comforts his people is with the vision of himself, is by being there with them. You can see this again in Nock as well. The comfort of these, the comfort for these people was God didn't sort of like, you know, uh, you know, make them all millionaires in this village. You know, God didn't sort of uh, bless them materially. What did God do? He blessed them and comforted them with the vision of heaven, the vision of himself and his mother. And this was a comfort, the comfort to these people whose faith is heroic. Okay, so that's one connection. Now, here's another one. You'll notice that the way that St. John describes uh, this scene is as the new Jerusalem. In, this, in verses 2 and 3 from chapter 21, we hear that the heaven descends, that heaven descends as a city. This is the city, Jerusalem the dwelling place of God, where God will live with his people. This is, again, this, the same idea of the portion. The ones who have overcome evil, who have faced the worst that evil could throw at them, could have thrown at them and remained faithful, they will receive their reward, their portion. And what is their reward? Not material goods, not, not sort of like, you know, uh, an endless, you know, round of golf or whatever sort of things that sometimes people hear say about heaven. What they receive is God himself. They are lifted up and they're made capable of union with God. Now, pointing towards this union with God, this city, look at the description of this city. 
this city is weird. It's very strange. It's very, the language is very figurative and it's, and it's, uh, it, it doesn't sound like any city you've ever heard of before, right? So first of all, the jewels, right? There are 12 jewels that are described as making up as, as being part of the city, like part of the, maybe the, the foundation or the walls of the city. Now, why, what are these 12 uh, jewels? What are, what are these 12 jewels about? Well, these exact 12 types of jewels, these exact 12 types were the types of jewels that were contained in the breastplate of the Jewish high priest. So when the high priest would go in to the presence of God, he would bring this breastplate. He would carry on him this breastplate with these 12 jewels that were embedded there that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. So symbolically brought into the presence of God were the people that God had chosen. His people were brought into his presence. Does that make sense? So again, you can see like this, it's, this, um, this description is pointing us towards this uh, promise of God that he will raise us up and make us capable of union with him. This is what God promises to us. You can see it in Nock and you can see it in Revelation. Here's another weird thing about the city, right? The city has no temple. The center of Jerusalem in the center of Jerusalem was the temple, the most important part of the city for a Jew. So why did this have no temple? There is no temple in this city. There's no single place where God is to be found because his holy presence will pervade the entire city. Did you notice the dimensions of the city? When we read the Bible, we have to read it really attentively. We have to read it really carefully, not just kind of gloss over it. Like, you know, when you're reading something on your phone, you're kind of scrolling and you're just sort of like taking in the gist of it. Like when you read the Bible, you have to read it much more attentively because the details matter. So did you, did you notice the dimensions of this city, right? The city is a cube. <laughs> it's weird. So it's as wide as it is long and as it is tall. The only structure in the Bible that is shaped as a perfect cube is the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is the center within the center of the temple, right? In the center of the temple, it was the place that only the high priest could go. It was the place where God, God's presence, his holy presence was um, kind of filled the Holy of Holies. So now this entire city is being shown to us as being the Holy of Holies. In other words, it is the place where God's presence will be found. The size of the city is really important to mention as well. Okay. How long, how big was the city? If you go back to your, go back to your text there, right? And uh, this is verse... 16, and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Do you know how big 12,000 stadia is? 12,000 stadia is over 1,300 miles. <laughs> 1,300 miles wide, 1,300 miles long, and 1,300 miles high, right? Now, the size is extremely significant because this was the size of the Roman Empire. The width of the empire was 12,000 stadia, 1,300 miles. So this new city is a new kingdom, far, far greater than the one that was brutally persecuting the Christians in that time. So what God is going to, what God has in store for them, what he is reassuring them is that they, their faith their, their faith, their faith will win them the, the presence of God himself and that what they have to look forward to is far greater than this thing that is, you know, either trying to seduce them or crush them. 
Now, if you look at the three figures of Nock, the union of God with his people is summed up in the presence of Our Lady, St. Joseph, and St. John. They represent the entire church, if you think about it, right? We're just trying to reflect on this now. Our Lady, why those three? Our Lady, St. Joseph, and St. John the Evangelist. They represent the entire church. A married couple. Those who are celibate. A priest. The church doing what the church should be doing. Think about what the three figures are doing. Praying. Teaching. And waiting. The book of uh, Back to This New Jerusalem. Another thing that points us towards this union with God. You have this divine light that's described. There is no sun or moon. There's no need for a sun or a moon because God's presence would literally light up the city. Light is one of the mystical phenomena that was described by the witnesses in Nock. I don't know if you know this, but the light from the apparition could be seen over half a mile away from the, from the, the gable wall. The people who witnessed it described it as radiant and as unlike anything they had ever seen before. All of these descriptions, the jewels, the, the, the proportions of the city, its size, the figures within Nock, and this, this divine light, all of these things help to explain the union that God is preparing for his people. Okay, here's another, here's a, another beautiful thing that I think helps us understand Nock and also the book of Revelation and what it means for us. And not only for us, but for all believers in every era. The most important image of the book of Revelation is marriage. Above anything else, right? And it's not the most popular one, or it's not the most talked about one, because all the other ones are kind of like really gory and they're, it's like battles and, you know, like, you know, there's plagues and all sorts of things. But the most important image of the book of Revelation is marriage. It comes closest to capturing just how beautiful that union that God makes his people capable of. Marriage comes the closest to like a fitting analogy describing just how beautiful the union that God makes his people capable of. Their portion, those who are faithful, is a union with God, which is so great that it is, it is described as a spiritual marriage. Now, in the book of Revelation, the, the city, Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, descends from heaven. How? Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, to those who were hearing the book of Revelation, they would have recognized that this was the final stage in the Jewish wedding ceremony. So a Jewish wedding was really involved. A Jewish wedding began with the betrothal. So this is where the husband and wife were legally married, but where they didn't live together yet. This was the time of preparation when, among other things, the groom would go and have to prepare a place for his bride where they could be together. By the way, you might remember in the Gospel of St. John where Jesus says, I go before you to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be as well. This is marriage imagery. This is Jesus talking as the groom to his bride, who is his people, okay? So just to point that out to you, it's really, it's an incredible thing. So the Jewish wedding began with a betrothal and it's this time of preparation, okay? The groom going to prepare a place. Then came the day, the big day. <clears throat> the bride would be adorned and made ready for her husband. The bride processed 
with her attendants, with her bridesmaids, to the home of her husband. And there the feast will have been, would have been prepared. And that day, they would consummate the marriage. And that was the first day of an eight-day celebration, beginning their life together. This was, again, the heavenly Jerusalem, adorned as a bride for her husband, descending, coming now. This was the day. The preparation was over. Now was the time of consummation when God would take his bride, his people, to be with him. Again, this is not like a sexual or a carnal union that we're describing. This is a spiritual marriage. But again, the your marriages, those of you who are married, are, is a sacrament. It's a sign pointing towards this. And it is, I mean, it's it's so beautiful. And the parallels are, are remarkable. <clears throat> you know, like your marriages are exclusive. Your marriages are fruitful. Your marriages are eternal. And all of these characteristics point towards this union between God and his people. Okay, let's think about Nock. Where's the bride in Nock? You might find yourself asking, where's the, where is the bride there? Well, what God does with every Christian soul and with the church, he sums up in one person, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So in some ways, she stands as bride. She is made beautiful and radiant. She's dressed in white to symbolize her purity, uh, her immaculate, um, her immaculate self, unstained by sin. But in another way, right, she stands there as the mother of the lamb. I always wondered why she was looking upward, right? Did you ever wonder that? Like there, there you are, right? She's, she's there in, in front of us. The lamb is on her left-hand side, but she's not looking at the lamb. She's looking upward. Maybe she's looking upward, waiting for the descent of the heavenly Jerusalem, the bride whom God is making ready, purifying, redeeming, adorning, to raise her up and give himself to her. Okay, what's the, the uh, uh, sort of um, something to take away ourselves? Again, we're reflecting on the apparition at Nock. We're reflecting on the book of Revelation. And we're trying to understand what is the meaning of it. One of the things that we might ask is, what does it mean for the church to be made ready? Jesus, first of all, we say this, Jesus makes the church ready. If you want to know what that means, I have a, a, a few verses from the Bible that you can look at. Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27. Jesus prepares his bride. He makes her holy. But the church... The people is not passive in this process. She cooperates with Christ making her ready. You'll notice in the book of Revelation, if you read it, that those who are the holy ones, described as the holy ones, those who have proven faithful, those who are in heaven, they are clothed in white linen. The white linen represents the deeds of the holy ones. Okay, so that's just pointing out that uh, it is by being faithful, by continuing to live the commandments of God, uh, by keeping oneself unstained by the world, I think is what it says in the letter of St. James, that we are that we keep ourselves ready, that we make ourselves ready to stand before God in heaven. 
to be faithful even to the point that we're willing to to suffer that we're willing to suffer some loss and even maybe the loss of our lives to be faithful no matter what we have a part to play in that just like those men and women who have gone before us again whose faith is nothing less than heroic now the last one i wanted to look at that first little bit from the from chapter 20 uh, two from the book of Revelation because um, it describes this river of life. So the heavenly Jerusalem, right, is described as having a river, the river of life that flows from where? The throne of God and the Lamb. And on both banks of this river grow the tree of life. The tree of life is like a, it grows on both sides of the river. So it's like a species. It's like a, a type of tree. And these trees, if you look at the description there in chapter 22, these trees bear fruit every month. They yield fruit and the leaves of the tree were medicinal. Now the saints, right, have always understood the water of life to be the Holy Spirit, which pour, is poured forth from the Father and the Son. The tree of life is the cross. And the fruit that comes from that tree is the Holy Eucharist. Again, the fruit of this tree is the tree of life, gives eternal life. God wants us to have that. He wants us to have that fruit. This goes exactly uh, completely against the, the lie of Satan in Genesis. Again, when, you know, Adam and Eve were there, he, he suggested that he lied to them and said that God was holding back on them. God wasn't holding back on them at all. At the very heart of Nock, what do we have? We have the cross and we have the lamb on the altar. Again, think about revelation now, right? This tree of life, which flows from the altar of the lamb and the Holy spirit is flowing. That's the Holy spirit is the symbolized by this the river of life. And on either side is this tree, which is the cross, the saints, often will we'll identify this as the cross and you have the Holy Eucharist at the very heart of knock is the cross and the altar of the lamb. This is the mass. One of the things that over and over and again, um, when people are explaining knock or trying to reflect spiritually on knock, the things that they keep coming back to are Mary and the mass, Mary and the mass. From the mass is poured out the richest blessings of heaven itself. And those blessings heal us like those leaves from the tree. They feed us like the fruit and they give us eternal life. Again, this is the tree of eternal life. So conclusion, trying to understand the meaning of knock. And we're trying to understand it with the help of the book of Revelation. What did it mean then, then for the people? What did it mean? What does it mean for us now? And what does it mean for our future? The first thing that we'd say is Nock was a consolation for the people in the time when it, when it happened, who again had proven faithful in the midst of terrible suffering. For them, it was, and it continues to be for us as well, a sign of hope and a call to faith. To be united with God himself. This is what we have to look forward to. It's all to fight for. We fight and we conquer the sin of the world and the flesh and the devil within our own hearts. And we work that Jesus would come to reign in other people's hearts as well. And the last thing that we might say Again, reflecting on this image of the river of life flowing from heaven, from the, 
the altar of the Lamb. We also see that Knock is a place where the graces of heaven are poured forth richly. And people continually point to it as hugely significant for the time that we're living in. Beyond itself, it points us to where the grace of conversion is given, the grace of healing, and where we can receive the living waters that flow from the altar of the Lamb. It points us towards the anticipation of heaven on earth, which is the Mass. So Knock itself is a special place, a place prob probably of particular graces. But beyond that, it points itself, it points towards the place where heaven and the graces of heaven are to be found here and now, which is in the Holy Mass. Okay. That is, that is the scratching this, just the surface of it. But again, I think uh, a really beautiful and worthwhile thing to reflect on trying to understand knock and its significance for the people in their day for our day as well. And what it teaches us as well um, kind of going forward and trying to understand the book of Revelation a little bit better as well. Just to say that I'm, I'll be taking a group of young people on a retreat now uh, for the next, uh, well, in a, in a couple weeks. Uh, if I can ask, please, for you to pray for this retreat for these young people. Um, they're at a uh, crossroads in their lives and it's really beautiful, uh, but we really need prayers and uh, kind of God's protection. So if you wouldn't mind maybe just remembering them for the next couple of weeks in your prayers, uh, we start on the 5th of August. So if you wouldn't mind, or 5th of July, sorry. We'll finish with a prayer and I'll give you a blessing. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you and give you his peace and protect you and stay with you always, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So if you wouldn't mind maybe remembering that in your prayers, I'd really be grateful. Okay? Wonderful.